this way, uh, there is a little bit of mingling throughout the entire process of uh, applying the paint. And it seems for me to keep a luminosity that I don't see in other ways. Today, we're going to rock your creativity. We're going to introduce you to Jean Peterson, who is one of the most creative people you have ever met. She's going to take you through some things that you've never thought about that will completely rock your world. I guarantee it. And you know, I don't speak lightly about those things. Jean, welcome. Hi, Eric. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're, uh, we're excited. We're celebrating around here because Jean has a brand new video out with us. And uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, it's called Mixed Media People. And you're going to see in a minute all the variety of the different kinds of artwork that Gene does. <clears throat> I'll show you a couple of things here real quickly. And it goes from very traditional to very non-traditional to really experimenting in a lot of different areas. And I think what you're going to find about Gene is that she will really help you push your limits in terms of your creativity. Of course, we're excited that Jean's going to be part of Watercolor Live coming up, which is our international conference. But first, let's get back and learn more about what we're going to do today. Great. What's the plan? Well, first, I'd like to show everybody a little slideshow that I put together to talk about, I guess, my philosophy of painting. And so if I'm teaching or mentoring a group, I I uh, talk about these kinds of things. So first well, thing- I'll tell you what we'll do, Jean. Uh, if you'll tell us what we're going to, you're going to show the slideshow and then you're yeah. going to do a little demo. Is that right? Yes, I'm going to do a demo, but I'm a, a little bit slow if I do wet glazing. So I pre-recorded myself video uh, painting an eye last week. Oh, cool. And, uh, cool. Yeah. That's and we can perfect. talk, yeah, and we can talk about it and you can ask questions and I'm happy to answer anything at all. Uh, as as the video or the slideshow is going on. So I'm going to pull up your uh, your slideshow, mm -hmm. and and then uh, you can get that ready, and then I'll kind of make it easy for people to. I'll, I'll drop out. All right. All right. Here we go. Good. I thought first it would be a good idea to talk about uh, my philosophy of painting, I suppose, and it, it'll, it's fairly quick. Uh, but first of all, we're talking about watercolor, and we are going to have this big watercolor live event, which I am so excited about because there has been a little bit of a, a vacuum with regard to these types of large events for watercolor painters. So what you'll see today is just a tiny snippet of what I'm going to be talking about at the watercolor live event. We will go into much more uh, depth and uh tell you a lot of my little secrets. But anyway, watercolor. Watercolor is a pigment that is suspended in a water-soluble solution. And I just snapped this with my iPhone and I thought, I have to use that, that's so good. So what are your intentions? I always go to, what are your intentions? There are so many techniques and paints and surfaces to choose from. And, and then you have to think about, what is it that you are trying to communicate? So I put this little chart together several years ago. And intentions, to me, is where it all starts. Uh, you talk about your intentions, and I'm, I'm just going to go a little further. What is your story? What is your idea? And then when you know what your idea is, what style are you going to communicate that idea in to your viewers? And then from there, you have to decide what elements of design and principles of design are going to help you to tell that story in that style. So those are the things that I find are very, very important. Here's an example of different styles. I was up in um, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, and I did a sketch of uh, Old Town, and then I sketched it in several different ways just to show that you know, there's so many isms around, and you have to decide what ism is yours. So would you like to be loose and gestural? And this is watercolor on Yupo, by the way. Do you want to be referential and emotional with some gesture in it, but not photorealistic? So this is more, I think, um, about the guts of how you felt about somebody and, and you know, really trying to come up with um, an attitude with your brush marks. Or do you want to be more classical in your referential piece, realistic, conceptual, local color? And uh, this was done with wet glazing. I do paint uh, wet in wet or wet in damp. 
uh, on a vertical surface. Um, I paint a number of different subjects. So you can paint figurative or still life or flowers or landscape or abstract. It doesn't really matter. We're just using shapes and elements of design. Now this piece is uh, a water media piece. So I've used all kinds of acrylics in here and collage. So I just wanted you to see the difference between doing something that's kind of realistic with not so local color and an interesting background and how you can combine that together. Uh, and then um, we can talk about how to answer these things. Uh, so what is the story? This, this story of this particular painting would be the veneration of a man and his music. It happens to be my father who played the fiddle. Uh, how does the artist tell its story and what are the intentions? So this is a referential image with craftsmanship. There is a strong triangular composition to this piece. And uh, there was a simplicity of brush marks too. So uh, although this is realistic, it is not photorealistic and I don't show every single pore and hair. So any of those ideas might be what you're interested in. Now this looks kind of weird, this map, but if you see this particular piece over here, this is called Paper Rose. This piece is actually in uh, the um, Museum of Watercolor in Fabriano, Italy. Uh, and if you stay doing that over and over and over again, that's fantastic. I have a tendency to, okay, I know how to do that. I can do it over and over and over again. What would happen? What if, what if, what if? What if I add a little bit of gouache to it? What if I add some acrylic to it? What if I put some gold leaf and gouache in it? So each, it's kind of like, uh, traveling from Calgary to Texas and on the way I might go to the Grand Canyon and I might go to all these different places so all these experiences then will affect how I would paint the same kind of subject uh, but with different media so I just I wanted to share this as well all of your experiences whether it's travel or interaction with your family staying healthy all of those things impact how you're going to create your artwork Okay, so this is what I do uh, today for this demo. I'm going to be doing wet glazing, layering on damp or wet paper on a vertical plane, so I work at an easel. I, I'm going to be trying to create the illusion of form. In order to have form, you have to have a light source, and then you have to be able to see shapes, the different shapes of values and colors. Now, this is an example of how you might be able to see these things. So I took uh, a photograph of a lemon, and then I dissected it into all of the different layers of values that you might see in order to try to create some form. Now this is simple, it's only you know five values, but uh, it, I think it gets the point across, kind of like a printmaker. And there's my eye, I'm gonna be painting my eye. I didn't try to turn my eyebrows apparently, but that's that's okay. And there's the drawing that I did of it. I have a drawing here as well that I can show you. All right, so, and the slideshow, there we go. There we are, okay, Eric, I can't hear you. Ah, but now, now you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as soon as you're ready, I, I just wanted to come on while you were getting your camera ready and, and mm -hmm. tell you that I thought it was so wonderful that you have such a variety in your work and that you're not, you're not allowing yourself to be uh, I don't want to use the word stuck because that works for some people, but to, to, to only do one thing. That's what I love is the fact that some days I want to be wild and creative and, and in different ways. And some days I want to be tight and realistic. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to think about your, your personality isn't just one thing. We Liner. have a whole bunch of different facets about ourselves <laughs> and it's nice to explore those different facets when, when we're painting. Absolutely. Okay, so you've got your video ready? I've got my video ready. Okay, go for it. Okay, here we go. So this is, uh, I've got a few of my, my images for you guys to see. These are watercolors that were done with wet glazing and they're more traditional in their way. This is uh, mixed media with collage. Another mixed media or water media with collage watercolor only, transparent watercolor. And this is what we're going to work towards. So I start off looking at a map of the eye with the lights, middles, and darks. And you saw the photograph earlier of my eye. 
And what I'll do is I'll start layering, just like we layer. Uh, glazing comes from glass. And so if you thought of uh, glass that was uh, pigmented, as in stained glass. Now, some of this is quite speedy because this uh, painting the eye took me over an hour to do. So putting this video together, I sped it up in some places. I don't usually paint quite that fast, but I wanted you to see the whole process. So I'll start to layer and each layer will make the, the surface darker and it will neutralize the paint more. So the, the intensity of the paint will lessen with each layer. Now you notice that I'm lifting up some paint as well as putting down paint. And the best way to do that is with working with a natural fiber brush. So I do try to, when I see them, the Kalinsky Sables on sale, I'll pick them up uh, because I really like the way you can suck up the paint as well as lay down the paint. So there I have one layer of paint. However, it, you see two values. And I just wanna start exploring <clears throat> my lights, middles and darks as I put down the paint. Um, yeah, have you any questions so far? All right, so this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually starting with, I'm trying to paint this, this uh, particular demo with only three paints, uh, a warm and a cool, red, yellow, and blue, and they are transparent. Transparency in layering wet and wet many, many times is important to keep your colors clean and luminous. So I started with Aurelian, and now I'm going in with quinacridone gold. Those are my warm and cool yellows. The reds I used were quinacridone magenta and naphthol red. I do use uh, Holbein pigments. I find that they're, they're extremely pure and luminous colors. There's a lot of great paint manufacturers though, and you, you have to find the ones that work for you, but I find these are extremely uh, good quality. So the next uh, color that I'll put down is going to be in the reds. And you'll notice, there I started doing the reds, that uh, any area that is lightest will not get many more layers of paint. And so those areas will dry first. By the way, I did wet the front and the back of the paper because I want the surface tension to be the same on the front and back of the paper. And that way the paper will lay flat on my board. I traditionally will use a gator board to paint on because it's a light, hard foam. And uh, the, the paper will stick to it, kind of suction up to it uh, nicely. I don't pre-stretch my paper for a number of reasons. And I try to use some bulldog clips on the corners. Now, should the paper get a little bit dry, I can lift up the back of the paper and re-wet it either with my brush or with a spray bottle. And uh, partway through this uh, demo, you will see that I have to do that in a few places. So this is only three layers of paint. And once I finish, that was quinacridone magenta that I put down. I try to use the biggest brushes I can for as long as possible, but I'm working on a fairly small eye. And so it would be very difficult for me to use uh, a one inch brush. And since I'm talking about the brushes, I, for this demonstration, had a one inch, a three quarter inch, a quarter inch flat brush in Kalinsky's. And then I had a 10, a six, and a two brush for getting into little details and corners. But I do try to use the largest brush possible for as long as possible. Now that's my warm red, that's my naphthol red, and I'm just trying to uh, shift my warms and cools and my colors so that I have repetition with variety. And you'll hear me say that a lot. All right, I put a little bit around the cheekbone and uh, the nose and so on, because normally if I'm doing a whole portrait, I can skip from one eye to a nose to an, the other eye and an ear, and the paper will stay damp, but the shine of it will go off. And every once in a while, you'll see me touch the paper, and that's just so that I can see how wet the paper is. So I'll be adding some blue next, and it might be a little shocking at first because... Uh, the last color that you put down is always your dominant color. 
So after I put the blue down, should I put some red or yellow on top? That'll be the dominant color. But now I'm starting to create a little bit more form because each layer gives me a darker value and it gives me a more neutralized color. The paper that I'm using is Arches 140 pound. I do paint on hot press and Yupo, but for wet and wet, uh, wet glazing, I do use, you know, Fabriano Artistico or Arches or um, Windsor Newton 140 pound. I find that those papers are, are very nice, very lovely rag papers. Question about what blue that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. That's a uh, phthalo blue red shade. And then I have a phthalo turquoise. So I've got a warm and a cool blue. I also stay away from pigments if I'm doing lots of layering. Let me qualify that. If I'm doing lots and lots of wet layering, I stay away from uh, the sedimentary colors as well. Uh, because, well, I uh, let me start with learning watercolor. And that was one of the first things that I learned in my artistic, uh, I guess, journey. It was the best education I could get because you're working mostly with the rawness of the material. There's not too much gumming it up. So if you see a raw sienna or an ultramarine, although it will have a flocculating agent in it, they will clump together and you'll get a granulation that's quite beautiful. But if you layer those over and over and over again, those, those pigments, they come from the earth, and the earth makes mud. That's the easiest way I can tell you uh, to, to not overmix those sedimentary colors. And the same happens with the opaque colors, things like your cadmiums. Now, all of those ideas can be translated or transferred to your acrylics and your oils. If you understand and know the pigment quality, whether it's a transparent or an opaque pigment and so on, it will help you out in, in any medium that you choose. This is just fabulous. There's so many positive comments. I love your teaching. You're such a good teacher. I wanted to tell you also, you've got people from Austria, Latvia, Costa Rica, Vancouver, mm -hmm. up there in Canada near you, Brazil, and Israel. Wow. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I'm, I really appreciate you being here. Hope I see you at the Watercolor Live event. That would be terrific. So I've gone in with more magenta. And really, there's no order that I use over and over again. It's a matter of looking at what you've put down so far and determining whether you like that or whether you want to go a different direction. So right now, the eyelid creases are quite red because it was too blue before. Now it's too red. So every time I put another color down, uh, it will shift towards that direction. Now in my first book that uh, is called Expressive Portraits, Creative Methods for Painting People, I have a chart in there that shows you how uh, if, you, if you use wet glazing, you get a much, much different effect than if you mix the same exact colors in your palette and then put them on your paper. I find that if you mix the colors and put them on your paper, they end up feeling dull. If you layer wet and wet or on damp paper, you get a much more luminous, glowing, uh, interesting colors and slight little shifts here and there that I think are uh, interesting for the viewer to look at. I know that sometimes, you know what else is kind of interesting about this is uh, at this point, let's say that I am I have to run to a doctor's appointment or whatever, you've got to go pick up kids from school. You can let this dry completely, bone dry, and then you can wet both sides right under the sink and then put it back on your board again and nothing will run as long as you know your pigments and use this particular technique. So I think that's pretty cool. If I were to do that with Yupo, yeah, I, it would all run away. So knowing your materials, understanding them, and knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are is a really, really good thing because you can take advantage of those strengths and weaknesses and help to tell your story and communicate your best intentions to the viewer.
Are there any questions, Eric? Uh, I don't have any questions now, but you guys can pop them into the comments. Uh, just everybody's loving it. A lot of positive comments. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand has joined us, Netherlands, Toronto. So you guys should post where you're from so that we know where you're from. Also, you can win prizes. But also, if you have questions, please speak up. Yes, it's. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and of course, I will be doing an entire face for the watercolor live, and we will go into more uh, more depth about how to set up your. Somebody model. asked, "What is Upo?" Oh, Upo. Good question. Upo is uh, an artificial paper. It's a plastic-based paper, and so it works like a hot press paper. The paint does not soak into it, so it's 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 a bit challenging at first. But once you get the the hang of it, you can come up with some really interesting textures and marks, and you can lift up almost back to the white of the paper again. Um, my friend George James was was a brilliant artist who used Upo a lot and uh, painted some really stunning pieces using Upo. Carlo O'Connor also is a fantastic artist who, who's really um, a master with uh, Upo and gouache. So anyway, you can see that I keep adding more and more layers of paint and I'm just switching from those six transparent warm and cool colors and I build up the value. Did it dry between layers? No, no. If you let it dry between layers, um, I find you don't get the same luminosity. A lot of people do a traditional glazing, which is put your paint down, let it dry, put another layer of paint down, let it dry. Uh, this way, uh, there is a little bit of mingling throughout the entire process of uh, applying the paint. And it seems for me to keep a luminosity that I don't see in other ways. You can do that. There's there's so many techniques in watercolor. I, I just taught a, a little class called uh, Watercolor Workout, and I talked about all the different ways, different techniques that one could apply to telling their story. And what you have to do is try them and see which one fits your personality and the subject and the style that you want to paint in. And, and uh, at least if you don't paint in those techniques and you understand them, when you go and see uh, an exhibition, you will be quite impressed with, with how the different techniques are used to make you know brilliant watercolors. Sounds like the next video we need to do. <laughs> sure, anytime. <laughs> what are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how the rest of this goes. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I mentioned before that uh, the actual painting of this, I took probably an hour and 20 minutes. So I've really condensed this into 20 minutes of, of video time. And you can see that, you know, it is, it's a lot of layers and we're still not dark. If you held up a value chart to this, we're just barely in the midtones here. Somebody asked if you ever put wax on your watercolor paintings. And if you do, what you, what do you use to adhere it to the board? Also, what surface board do you use? So I'm assuming they mean, do they mean for adding as a resist or do they mean as a way of sealing your watercolor? You know, I don't know the answer to that. So maybe you can answer both of those. Okay. Uh, a lot of artists in the last several years have started putting wax on top of their watercolor to seal it so that they don't require glass. And I do not use that. Um, it's not that I'm against it or anything. I, uh, I'm really, really open to doing whatever makes the best painting that you can. And that, you know, if that's in oil, acrylic, mixed media, watercolor, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I think that glass can be problematic, but if I paint a transparent watercolor, I'm probably more likely if I'm going to put something over it, I'm more likely to put a, a matte or a gloss medium over it instead of the wax. And, um, you know, wax can have a few problems with, with heat and it can get dull and it can also scratch. Uh, and scratching isn't 
the problem. It just dulls it down. And then you have to buff it every once in a while to bring back the clarity and the shininess of it. And um, of course, you can use wax as a resist. So you can put it down with it on a dry surface, whether it's uh, white paint or uh, paper that has a lot of pigment on it. And you'll see that if you paint over top of it, the paint will not stick where the wax is. And John Singer Sergeant Winslow Homer did that an awful lot back in the day. So this idea of what is a transparent watercolor is a fairly new idea historically. In the past, they didn't have white paper and they had to paint uh, on, on a tinted paper and they used body color or gouache to add their lights. Some paintings that I've seen in museums the gouache is thick, you know, almost a quarter of an inch thick popping off of the page if they were doing clouds or seascapes or whatever. So I, I think that uh, if we could be a little bit more open minded to what a water watercolor can be, instead of uh, following all the rules that somebody told you about, uh, I think, um, you know, creativity and, and thinking outside the box and thinking about what could be is exciting. And even if you don't want to go in that direction for a long time, like I said, if you go back to your traditional practice, then what you're going to do will be affected by the uh, experiments and the practice in other ways. And I think that's a good thing. It's, it's good to grow. It's good to push yourself. Someone said uh, Sergeant and Homer used wax to seal their paintings. Okay, to seal them too. Good. Yeah, I know that they use them as resists, so that's interesting. But you know, when you're out on the road doing plein air painting, um, maybe you know, maybe it was a good way too to make sure that it, they didn't get soiled. I don't know if they did that in the studio or or out and about, but um, yeah, I haven't seen any of theirs in life that were sealed with wax. But uh, now I'll be in search of those. So you can see that uh, I'm getting a lot more value put into this and the colors are becoming less intense and maybe more natural. I do have a tendency to exaggerate a little bit with the color. I think it makes for a little bit more exciting image. Question is, do you ever erase your pencil lines after you've done your painting? I and do. Is that even possible? I didn't know. Yes. That. Well, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. I uh, have experimented with a number of different pencils, and weirdly enough, I find that the F pencil, Stadler F pencil, works really nicely for drawing and for erasing afterwards. Now, I do have the painting finished here, and I have erased the lines off of it. It won't be on the video, but I can hold it up after the video is finished to show you that you can you can't really see any pencil lines i'm surprised by that because i just assumed that if you put an eraser on it it would erase the color too yeah yeah i know it's weird isn't it well that's just beautiful all right any other questions chime in if you've got questions yeah now we're getting a bit of a kick of a dark you see that few more brush strokes here and there, and the folds in the eyelid will be deep, deeper. So sometimes when I teach, I'll see somebody painting a blue eye, and they'll literally take the blue and paint the eye blue. And if you look at somebody with blue eyes, they're not all the same color all the way around, and they are not a pure blue. So my eyes are kind of, they're, they're different. They've got spots all over them and there's layers of, you know, blue, gray, yellow, green. Uh, and so that's that's what I do when I paint my eye. And, and actually I find that even if it weren't those colors, it looks more interesting than being one solid color. If you'll post the final painting uh, when we're done here, that'll be really helpful in the comments. Oh, okay. Okay. You bet. Okay, we're almost done. I think we've got another 20 seconds or something. So that's my demonstration of an eye as quickly as I could give it to you. Somebody asked, when do you think you're going to be able to come back to the States? Obviously, they want to take a workshop. 
<laughs> well, I don't think it's going to be too long. I'm supposed to be teaching a workshop. Let me get out of this. I'm supposed to be teaching a workshop in Key West in February, so I'm really hoping that's going to work. Yeah, yeah. that would be nice, wouldn't there. it? There. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Well, oh. fabulous demo. Let's see it. Show it. I'm going to get you on full screen here. Um, I have to do it the right way. There we go. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. Wow. And you'll see that uh, I have some of my, my watercolors up behind me. We have a little time if you want to show your studio. Oh, <laughs> this is my home place where I've set up a, a Zoom sort of thing. And it's really messy. My I have a studio downtown in downtown Calgary in an old building that's about 110 years old. Okay. And it's set up quite nicely. I do paint here. And during um, during COVID, I did a lot of painting here because they told you to self-isolate. Right. So I've got this little desk right here. And um, let's see. You can see a sink over there that's really messy. Ah, I'm one of those abstract random people and it just gets worse and worse the further away from what you're seeing there you go and there's an outside you could probably see some of the snow out there but uh, yeah so this is my my little home space nice uh, yeah oh well, that's good so if you've got any other questions or comments for me or what, what else can i tell you well i think you should uh just while i've got you on here first off i want you to tell i'm going to pull up I want you to tell us about your new video. Yes. Talk about that. Absolutely. This video, uh, one of the things that I like to do is mix different mediums together. And so this particular video is about simplifying the figure. I know that sometimes uh, people and faces can be a little intimidating if you haven't done that before. And so this video is geared towards anybody, but especially those who uh, might think, gee, I can't do a figure. And I, so I show you how to simplify the figure using ovals and triangles and squares and how you don't have to follow the colors and the values that are there. You can have some fun and balance your colors and think about, well, can I have a polka dot leg? Why not? And so should I then balance those polka dots somewhere else? repetition with uh, variety. So you can see that there's some larger polka dots in her bodice, and then there's some tinier ones in her leg. And then you'll see other other things that are repeated with variety as well throughout the whole thing. And it reads as, as a, a young woman sitting on a stool and just relaxing, being comfortable and thinking. I also did some writing in the background to uh, write about some of my thoughts with regard to the story that I'm telling in this particular piece. So we start with uh, collage and then how to add paint on top of the collage, how to come up with a, a simple design. And I even did some small maquettes with different colors ahead of time to show you different possibilities and then you choose the one that you like the best and apply it to your larger piece that you're working on. Can you explain uh, what a maquette is? Oh, of course. A maquette is just a smaller, a small version of what you might want to do in a larger format. And so would that be the equivalent to a study? Uh, yes, it could be. Uh, um, I think these were perhaps, oh, I don't know, maybe four by four squares that I did that were small maquettes. However, um, you know, some architects might do a maquette that's quite large in a room, but they're building an enormous building. And so right. uh, a maquette's just a smaller version. Okay. So you would do, when you were doing the small studies, you would do the mixed media and everything. It's not just a matter of just doing the painting. Um, I just did colors and values first. Okay. Uh, and, and then I put the uh, collage down and I ignore the collage and draw my design on top. And then I chose the color pattern that I wanted and applied that to the, the piece that you see on the cover. Okay. Now, so, next, I want you to talk to me about this video. Hmm. Um, this is your first video with us. Tell us about that. Well, this is the first video in a long time with us. You did some a long time ago. That's right. That's right. Well, this piece is a little bit more realistic. Again, if you go back to my slide presentation at the beginning, what are your intentions? 
are you going to paint referentially or non-referentially? So this is a referential image. It's a little bit more realistic. There's the uh, feeling of form in this, whereas the simplified figure is very flat in the way it's, it's approached. So there's two different reasons for painting each of these. This one also uh, talks, this is acrylic and I use transparent and opaque pigments and I use gesso and colored pencil collage in here as well. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit more realistic. I'm, I'm not worried about it having the same colors that I might've seen in person. I'm using non-local color and you know, just really having fun with edges and and some shapes blending into others, and where I can um, integrate collage so that it feels like it should be there. And then when you go up close, you'll go, oh, how cool is that? You'll see all kinds of little changes and shifts in both the surface um, relief and colors and values and textures. Okay. Now tell me about this book, Expressive Portrait. <clears throat> well, that was my first book, and uh, I worked on that. Uh, quite a few years ago, because um, I, I've, I had won um, many, many awards with my watercolor portraits. And so the publishers came to me and asked me if I'd like to do a book. So this particular book would be really good for all those watercolors out there, because I do start with the basics of watercolors, uh, the different types of pigments, how they layer, how to look for your value map in a face. I, I specifically uh, am focused on the face in this book, although all of the ideas and the techniques can be transferred to any other subject or style. A lot of books are like that. So if you just you know read it and say, how can I apply layering wet and wet to what I'm doing? Or how can I use these ideas of, of mixing a sedimentary pigment and a transparent pigment together? In, in my work. So uh, I, I start with watercolor and then I move into gouache. You see on the front cover here, the background is kind of a gray green color and that is gouache. And I applied that gouache, uh, a wet paint on a dry watercolor. So at first I was really searching for how dark can I make a watercolor? This, this was my, you know, 25 years ago. How can I make the darkest dark and still be luminous? And then I thought, how can I push my opaques as far as I can without it being, you know, dead? And once I had done that with the watercolor, I introduced gouache, which often has calcium carbonate in it, uh, a chalk, and that's what makes it opaque. So I, I did a lot of work with watercolor and gouache together. And then I moved from that to gesso. And gesso is an acrylic product that often does have calcium carbonate in it too, something opaque. And I started to use gesso rather than gouache because the gouache had its limitations. If you put it down, you pretty well have to, it's, it's hard to layer one on top of another. It's kind of like painting Alla Prima with oil. You kind of have to slide that next layer on and then just leave it. If you do more work with it, you'll start lifting up the paint or mixing it. So if I use gesso with that, then it dries as a plastic and it stays exactly the way I wanted it to be. So I started doing more mixed media stuff, watercolor and acrylic, and then acrylic and collage and so on. So that it kind of makes sense if when I tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're a wealth of information. I'm going to show this other book. Uh, this one's called Mixed Media Painting Workshop. Just give me 30 seconds on this one. Well, this one takes it a step further with uh, how to integrate different types of uh, mediums together. I also have included in this book other artists who use the concepts in different manners uh, to to create their own work. So uh, it it has a lot of my work, and then it has uh, some of my the people that I think you know do a bang up job with with their genre. And uh, so if you're interested in acrylic and different types of uh, mediums and collage, this would be a good book for you. All right. Here is the, uh, here's a picture of the final painting, by the way. Right, there you go. And you can see that I've erased the pencil lines. Oh yeah, wow. Like I say, you know, every day there's a new lesson. I had, had never had heard that all yeah. these years. Well, I'm excited about learning about <clears throat> watercolor 
I have, uh, I've decided, you know, if it's good enough for Sargent, I've always been an oil guy, but uh, I just am, as I get to this point in my life where I don't want to carry as much heavy gear all the time, I, you know, I'll carry it in the car. I'll, you know, I'll go backpacking with it, but there are moments when I want to have paints, but I don't want to take my, my oils. And so I've decided I need to master watercolors. <laughs> and so I'm excited. What are you going to do on watercolor live? Well, I'm going to do a full portrait ah. so uh, so that you can actually see how to put the whole thing together. And it'll pro I don't know if it'll be a three-quarter pose or a, a full face. but and it'll, and it'll be in a realistic style? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about how to set up your model. So I've got my next door neighbor as my model right now. And I'm just going to talk about Vermeer Light. And then I'll take that piece and show you how to make a map of where your lights, metals, and darks are. And then I'll start all this wet glazing. Exciting. Did you say Vermeer light? Yeah. Yeah. I just saw they had the, they got the new film out on uh, uh, Van Megan, who was the guy who who sold all the fake Vermeers to the Rush to the to the Nazis. And it's it's really a fascinating. I've read the books, but it was a fascinating story. They mm -hmm. actually made him out to be a good guy instead of a nasty forger, which is mm -hmm. interesting. So it was pretty good.